How's life, buddy? Hey, Glenn, doing great. How about you? Not bad under very testing circumstances, right? Yes, this is absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, uh, talk a little bit about how it's affected you uh, personally, and and then uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about what you think is going to happen to poker and how that affects you because of your career, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess it all happened pretty quick, and uh, obviously all the live uh, poker tournaments, which are really my – that's my forte kind of. Uh, they are canceled for the foreseeable future. Uh, so, yeah, I mean – definitely is going to like directly affect my equity bottom line. But, uh, you know, I, I try not to, there's like online poker is a big thing now. Uh, that's going to be going to be the focus. And I've like, honestly, online, you know, I used to play a lot. I've always played online kind of like casually and never really like fully dedicated myself to it. I've been fortunate to like run pretty good in the live stuff where I wasn't like incentivized to really grind online. Um, but I'll definitely uh, be doing quite a bit of uh, studying and online playing, online poker playing for the foreseeable future, I guess. I mean, it's pretty, it's such a shame, isn't it? That um, the world has, has such a hang up over online poker because from the poker player's perspective, it, it, nobody's going to complain about being self quarantined if they can play against the whole world in poker. Right? It, it's just like everyday life, right? Yeah, it's not not that much of a change. Uh, I'm sure for a lot of guys that have been playing online poker full time for many years, it's not much of a change at all. Um, for my the few days I've been involved in it, yeah, my experience has just been playing online, ordering delivery food. You know, it reminds me of like ten years ago when I was doing it. Honestly, though, I've like I'm actually kind of I've been going so hard for so many years, like being trapped. You know, a lot of uh, traveling for both poker and leisure and, you know, just dedicating myself a lot to uh, a lot of time to poker. I'm kind of excited. Uh, fortunately, I'm not like super pressed for money right now. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. excited just for the opportunity to, you know, maybe do some other things, read and like enjoy like the awesomeness that is real life a little bit. Yeah, it was a, a good time to bink such a big win last year, <laughs> you know, in hindsight, like, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a really challenging period for a lot of people out there. But uh, um, let's go back in time to the beginning of your hero's journey and uh, your, your backstory a little bit. What is it about your family uh, that makes them a little bit mad? <laughs> you, you mean in their acceptance of me uh, playing no, poker? No, no, no. Just, just, just in general. Like, you know, like, so for example, my family, you know, when this, they're, they're like, you know, when the coronavirus, you know, kicked off, they're like, ah, you know, like, this is nothing. It's a load of nonsense and all that. And then and then one day later, they're ringing me up saying, Lee, 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 you've got to quarantine yourself, you know. And my, my, my family are a little bit like moany, groany, and that makes them a little bit mad. What is it about your family that makes them a little bit mad? Oh, well, that's a tough one. I honestly have nothing, nothing but awesome things to say about, uh, like, I grew up in a household of my mom, my dad, and my two sisters. Um, my mom kind of grew up in a small town, Alabama, which was, I grew up in Birmingham, like kind of a big city in Alabama. Uh, and she was just, or has been just the most amazing supportive mom in, in everything that I've done. Uh, my dad, uh, was born in Ohio and he spent a lot of time, uh, traveling, uh, or like moving, moving around different places. He went to high school down in Miami. So he's like both my parents, uh, <clears throat> are just like so awesome in their own way and have been so uh, so supportive of everything and uh yeah i've got nothing but <laughs> nothing but awesome things to say about them honestly nothing mad about them whatsoever huh yeah <laughs> what, what was it like growing up in alabama um back in the day then uh, it, it was cool it's very uh i grew up playing sports so it was very like it was a big uh big community there so like all of my time was spent I grew up in a neighborhood where I had like, you know, 10 guys who would play every sport imaginable around the neighborhood. Um, and I was just like always outside and that's, that's stayed true to me now. Like I'm such a nature guy. I just love being outside doing things. So yeah, it was a lot of that playing. I played baseball my whole life. So that was huge. I was uh, always like a huge sort of competitor in everything I did. So academics were huge to me. I always had like straight A's. Um, and was like, had some perfectionist, uh, qualities that definitely still, 
still hold true with me now that I'm trying to shed. Um, yeah, it was just a really uh, cool, like easy upbringing for me. I never faced struggle. Uh, my parents divorced when I was like 10, maybe. So that was, uh, I dealt with that dynamic, like with like so many kids uh, these days. So, so many people my age, uh, their parents, I guess, are divorced these days. Uh, so yeah, there was that. That was probably the biggest, uh, I guess, like struggle I ever endured. Yeah, it was interesting that you said, oh, I had no, no struggles in my life. My, my parents divorced when they were 10. I was thinking, wow, that, that, that seems a bit of a struggle. Because um, I, I, I actually divorced from my, son, my son's mother when he was 10 as well. Um, and I know, you know, it, it depends what happens afterwards to each parent, but I, it was tremendously challenging for my boy. Um, how, how did it affect you and how do you think it changed your trajectory as a kid, if it indeed it did. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm sure it, uh, I, as a guy growing up in the South, you know, you're taught to never, or just in general in the U S or anywhere in the world, probably guys are even taught like not to shit, talk about how they're feeling. Hmm. Uh, you know, vul- vulnerability was not a thing. Vulnerability is only something I recently learned in my life. So yeah, I'm sure it affected me in ways just, uh, you know, just see, my parents not get along and stuff. I'm sure that had like some effect on me, uh, you know, that I can't, can't really identify, you know? Yeah. I got a three-year-old and, you know, sometimes I behave in a certain way with her and my wife will say, Oh, you, sh- no, you shouldn't really behave like that. And I'll say, well, she's not showing me any signs that there's any issue with it. And then she reminds me that very often we don't realize what effect it has on us until somewhere along the line, something happens and we end up on a therapist chair and they weave it back to that moment. Right. Did you, did you continue to have relationships with both your parents? Yes, definitely. My, uh, I ended up like spending my uh, teenage years living with my mom and sisters, but my dad lived nearby like 15 minutes away and was always super active in my life and super financially supportive and was the best dad I could ever dream of so uh yeah I had it I, I wasn't you know I didn't there was never any, like my parents I guess just didn't uh their relationship eventually went different ways but I never like there was never issues of like addiction or abuse or anything like that so I'm super fortunate uh for that and I was happy you know lucky to have both both parents present yeah the reality is relationships are just as you know relationships are hard work like mm. if there's even aspect of like i'm in a six-year relationship now and i but there's even one aspect that's off for either one of the two of you i feel like it's capable of like you know pulling the relationship <laughs> pulling the relationship down and it's, a, it's yeah. a rough world we're all dealing with our own struggle and it's it's good to talk about these things and um, yeah therapy is great it's been helpful for me yeah you talked a little bit uh, um there about when you were younger you had you actually used the word perfectionist qualities um mm. And if you ever read, do you ever read any Brenny Brown's work? I've seen some of her uh, videos. Yeah, because uh, she, she she says the three shields against vulnerability, you know, to prevent you from being vulnerable. One is uh, foreboding joy. The other one is numbing, uh, you know, alcohol addiction or whatever. And then the third one is actually perfectionism. Because mm-hmm. if, if you keep driving to be a perfectionist, um, you're not, it's because you're terrified of people um, seeing the real you and th- that you could fail and, and, and what that means. Where, where do you think that that came from in you as a youngster? It's a good question. I've really, really tried to identify it. I think possibly just because I was like so competitive, like e- even, uh, you know, when we play ga- games around the uh, neighborhood, like I wanted to win so bad. Um, uh, and definitely self image has been a huge thing. I think that's hugely popular for everybody or a huge problem for everybody, but self image uh, and trying to like control what people think was a huge issue for me uh, for many, many years. So that's, uh, I was probably trying, I had perfectionism in the sense that I would, you know, not want to be seen any way other than like exactly how I wanted to be seen kind of, and that was fucking exhausting. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not, uh, I was never like put, my parents never like put put me under any, uh, any pressure like that. Maybe just the community of like athletic, you know, like athletics at a high level 
growing up is the only thing I can think. I had a moment once when I was um, around nine. It just come up in a therapy session for me, actually, because I, I have inadequacy issues sometimes. So if I put if I put a poker article out and then ten people say it's good and one person says it's bad, it I have issues with it, right? So I, I had some therapy and, and they they we went back to this like nine year old who had been dropped not not on the bench for for soccer but off the team completely on this Saturday, and I couldn't mm-hmm. cry because all the guys were in the changing rooms. And then from that moment on, I developed this kind of like moment in you know of inadequacy. Did you ever have anything like that in sport? where you had to face adversity and get over it? Or was you always naturally great? Um, I was, that's interesting. Yeah, I definitely think that uh, our development as, as children is just so, you know what I mean? It's, it's so key in uh, what makes us who we are. Honestly, not really. I kind of, uh, I kind of picked up sports naturally. I think, uh, I think maybe some other things made me feel inadequate in the sense that like, I was concerned about like my big ears <laughs> and the fact that I was like uh, a little chubby as a kid or the fact that I was uh, made fun of for having a girl's name uh, a lot. So that I think I definitely, uh, that definitely like brought, made me like retreat within. Uh, so yeah, it was probably more so that. Did that, did that make you angry as well? I mean, did you ever, did you ever get into fights and, and trouble, you know, kind of like that pent up frustration? Um, not so eh, a couple, couple little uh, skirmishes here and there, but I think more just like, uh, pain inside that, uh, I wasn't capable of like sharing with anybody given that I knew nothing about vulnerability and it's just not, it's just not taught or it wasn't taught back in those days. No, not as a kid. No way. I mean, if you use clo- if you use to close your eyes now and, 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 and have an image of your bedroom when you was a child, obviously a child spans a, a long time. What does it look like? What were the posters on the wall? What were the things around your room? What were you proud of in that bedroom? What was it like? It was all sports. Um, I had sports posters. I loved all football, basketball, baseball. So I had I was a big like uh, baseball card collector. Uh-huh. I had a bunch of stuff like that. I had all my trophies from my uh, from my sports. Um, had a nice uh, TV set up in there that, that I'd watch sports on. Uh, just really, really fun times looking back on those moments. I had a great childhood. So when you when you were growing up and you're into sports, um, you're also academically excelling as well. Uh, did you ever have any young, undeveloped um, career aspirations in in any regard? <clears throat> I was honestly just my whole life. All I dreamed about was being a professional baseball player. Right. I dedicated everything to baseball. It was school and baseball. I never really thought like I worked hard on academic because I really wanted to just like make straight A's and get all the awards and stuff. But I never, uh, academically, I never like, you know, for like real world, uh, jobs, I never wanted to be anything but a uh, pro baseball player. So you wanted to be a pro baseball player. What was the, what was the time? I mean, you know, how how I was been reading this book by Angela Duckworth called Grit. So she talks about how um, everybody bangs on about talent. Oh, you know, Shannon's naturally talented as a baseball player or whatever. But the people who really make it are the ones who show grit, not talent. The ones who've got the determination and resilience and, and that kind of stuff. But also there's other key aspects that these people have as well that makes them great. And one of them is, for example, let's say you have a parent that takes you to lessons every day, that gets you into clubs, that provides the money for the right gear and all that kind of stuff. So how serious was your goal to be a baseball player? How far did you get? What support did you get? And ultimately, how did it all fall apart? And why do you think that happened? Uh, I had a ton of support from my parents. We literally were just at the ball, both my sisters. I have two sisters who played softball as well. So we just lived at like the community ballpark. Uh, we were there every night. One of us had a game or a practice. So we were, and then when the others were playing, you know, we'd be out playing catch with our friends. Like just everything was about sports. So yeah, I had, uh, it was all, I, uh, Cahaba Heights uh, Athletic Association was the, uh, association. And it was a huge community of, uh, like a lot of great athletes came out of there. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a good opportunity. And that, I think that was, like you said, so just to have access to facilities and stuff, that's huge for, you know, whatever you're doing. 
And uh, yeah, it worked out well. I was a pretty good high school baseball player. And it came to a point where I, I had an offer to go play at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, which was my hometown. Or I could go, uh, I was much more interested in going to the University of Alabama, the bigger school in Tuscaloosa, about a about an hour away from where I grew up just because I was like a kid and I wanted to get out. I'd had like a taste of partying when I was in high school. You know, I realized like, oh, this is, you know, it was just like a video game when you're 17 years old and you go down to a university and you just see like all the partying, girls, food everywhere. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, it was a pretty eye-opening experience. But I really wanted to do that. And I tried to go, to, go down there and walk on and it, and it didn't work out. But uh, honestly, I think my time, baseball had been like such a big part of my life up until that point that it was, it was time for me. I, I think in the back of my head, I sort of was like ready for a new chapter anyway. Plus it just, I wasn't good enough where I was ever going to, uh, where it would have been very tough to like make it to a very high level at that point. So you, do you realize that you dream of becoming a, a baseball player? How old are you when you realize that this, this is, uh, I enjoy it and I love it, but I, I'm never going to be a professional baseball player. How old are you when, then? I was probably about a senior in high school at that point. You just, you know, you travel around like to different states and stuff. And it's just humbling, like seeing like just how mm. good some of these guys are. Um, and just like, you know, by that point, I'd been exposed to the reality of like how small a percentage of people you know, actually make it to the top level in sports. Um, but it was an awesome, uh, I learned so much, you know, being able to be in community like that all my life and uh, be able to push myself, uh, I think was huge for me in terms of my personal development. And we'll talk about how you got into poker a little bit in a minute, but what was it about your childhood and, and your exposure to sports and stuff that has helped you to develop this grit that has allowed you to be in, in the business for so long? Um, I think, like I said, sports, I think just uh, like there's, there's several all different types of people that get into poker. There's like a lot of guys who like were huge into video, you know, gaming, sports. Um, there's businessmen that find their way in, you know, everybody, people that just seem to have pushed themselves and are like resiliency is huge in poor poker because you're going to just lose money so often. <laughs> And you're gonna like emo emotionally be a wreck so often. So like the ability to like have experience doing that. If you don't have any experience doing that, I think it's gonna be really hard to to excel in it. Kind of. Um, additionally, I've been exposed to poker when I was a kid. We'd play uh, just like you know games for pennies and nickels around the house, playing like a seven card stud and Dr Pepper and baseball. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, it was kind of. Uh, <laughs> kind of funny that I ended up playing poker after, after doing that with my family in my living room. How did, how did, um, obviously a, a poker journey is a, a long journey, so we'll, we'll not shut it down a little bit, but ha tell us uh, the most important moments that happened to you in terms of playing Dr. Pepper and baseball around the kitchen table to being the Shannon Shaw that's playing professionally. What were the key moments I I in that journey that got you there? Uh, I think, just being exposed to the game uh, to a point where I was interested in cards and, uh, you know, money exchange, you know, the exchange gambling. Um, it's funny. I remember in, in high, like I, that clearly like struck a chord with me because in high school I ended up like some friends and I would <laughs> like gamble on games around the neighborhood. Like we'd play golf uh, in these holes that we cut out in the grass. We'd play ping pong or pool for like a couple bucks, you know, so uh, I, I had a taste for uh, gambling. You know, money is just, money is such an interesting, uh, just everyone's relationship with money I find, find so interesting. So I think that whatever, <clears throat> whatever your relationship you have with it, like in your, when you're growing up probably affects, uh, affects your relationship with it as you get older. And I definitely at a time when I was like in my early 20s, I was very like obsessed with like trying to make as much money as possible. Um, until sort of like now, I feel like I have a much uh, more realistic uh, idea about money and how it you know doesn't bring all the happiness that that everybody uh, wants you to think that it does. But yeah, it's it's a, like a crazy measuring stick for for so many. So you're 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 gambling with your friends, you're gambling for money. You're very very competitive, so the two really go really well, I guess, because you're getting that kind of like dopamine hit every time you're winning a bit of money. 
as well as <laughs> his gambling. But when did you know, like my my boy now, he's with the coronavirus. I said to him, if "You've got no problem, mate. You just stay in the house and play video games like you do anyway for like two months on end. Like it, like a game like that can become like so addictive where you're just playing like Call of Duty all the time or World of Warcraft or something." When did poker start to overtake your life for you? That was when I was a actually a freshman in college. Um, Right, that was when uh, Money Makers stuff was airing on uh, ESPN, and somebody's. Uh, I had a college apartment, and uh, that's we would get like one of the one of my buddies came over one day and was like introducing us to the game, <laughs> and we put five bucks in and started playing, and then we probably played like ninety percent of the nights that first semester, um, and then I yeah I was absolutely obsessed with it. Cause I've always been like a big numbers guy. And like I mentioned, you know, I was interested in gambling and competition. <clears throat> so it, it really fit, it fit right in for me. And along with my like perfectionism, it was uh, something that I could just like, now that I didn't have baseball, it was something I could like work really hard on. So yeah, I did that. And then I uh, deposited online and uh, lost a few thousand dollars over probably the course of a year. Um, and I was playing God knows how many hours a week has <laughs> been, Uh, My grades definitely suffered in college as a result. Um, Started playing online. uh, Actually met Jonathan Little, and he sort of like mentored me through AOL Instant Messenger. (laughs) And uh, yeah, the rest is history, kind of. So when when you're playing poker, and and I know myself from my own journey how all-consuming it can be. I I remember being soccer crazy, and then when poker come along for the first time in my life. Soccer didn't mean as much as poker did. Like I would miss a, I would miss a soccer game to play a poker, and I was like, "What is going on?" Right. Um, at, whilst that's happening, and you're getting more involved in that, what is going on in your life though? So, you know, you, you what are you studying? What are you thinking about it? How are you getting along with people at school? What's going on at the same time this poker game's going on? It was basically poker and partying and school. <laughs> I was. Uh... You know, I was 19 and the cult at the University of Alabama, which is one of the biggest party schools in the U.S., the culture was just like to drink five nights a week. You know, all all 18 year olds drank from the time they got down there, mm-hmm. like they revolved around party. <clears throat> so that was like an enormous part of my life. It was basically that it was basically, uh, yeah, either go out or play online poker. And, uh, yeah, I had, I had quite a few friends that I knew from like the baseball world, different schools that went down that ended up going to school there. Additionally, people I went to high school with, so I had, like a pretty big community. So it was just fun. Uh, it was just like, a you know, my introduction to adulthood, <laughs> but, uh, it's crazy. I'm lucky I survived. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, you know, I, like I, I remember all my first moments. So I remember my first drink of alcohol i remember my first uh amphetamine hit i remember my first lsd trip right and my first time i sniffed poppers all these kind of things what was what was you like was you um was you an easily swayed kid and did you get into drinking drugs because of peer pressure or was you like fucking give it here or did you dodge it what what was you like around because obviously when we're a teenager we were almost like biologically driven to take these huge risks Plus, we want to be part of the tribe as well. And you talk about being perfectionism, which links to wanting to fit in. So tell us a little bit about how you handle drink and drugs coming into your life as a teenager. I mean, I think that I like it was it was literally like sport, you know, like it was for bragging rights. Who could drink the most? Uh, we count count our drinks. You know, we'd play games to see who could drink what faster. It was fucking insane. Um, I think for me, it was uh, like, obviously it's, I was always like a pretty shy, shy kid. I mean, I had friends, but I was like never able to like truly be myself. And I maybe it relates to those things I talked about earlier where I was just like retreated within, which is never vulnerable at all. Not that I became much more vulnerable, but at least I was like more out there in the world and like sort of uh, like with girls, I was never as a high schooler, that was like never a big thing for me. Then in college, when you know there's lots of girls around, and it's like a party scene. I think just like trying alcohol is just you know it lets you like lose your 
lose your uh, inhibitions, obviously. Mm. So I, I think that was a, a big part of it for me. And no drugs? You you managed to skip the drugs part of it? Um, yeah, I've never done like hard drugs in my life. Um, I do dabble in psychedelics uh, and smoke weed occasionally. Uh, but yeah, I never uh, ne- never dealt with drug addiction. How how did the as you're growing up and you're you're playing the poker side of things? How how is the poker interacting with your life? How is poker changing you as a personality? Because you, I know that some people can jump on a poker table and they're like a fucking rock star, but before they jump on the poker table, they're just they're like little mice. And it's the same as sport; they could be little mice. And they get on the football field and they want to fight everybody. <laughs> it's like where's where's this fucking anger come from? Um, how did yeah. poker help? create Shannon Shaw the man? Um, what I love about poker, particularly since I got into, or my experience with poker, with poker is that when I was 19 or 20 maybe, I won a, a trip online, a satellite online to go play in Australia. Hmm. Prior to that, I never really even traveled much farther than the southeast of the United States. Um, so I was, it was just introduced me to the world kind of uh, and just so many different personalities and stuff. And it taught me, uh, taught me like acceptance, uh, of everyone. You know, it's just like the poker community is such an awesome community because there's just so many people from all walks of life. And most are, most are pretty well-traveled and, uh, have a lot of life experience. So it just like exponentially, uh, just exposed me to lots of different ways of life that I didn't know about growing up in Alabama. Why do you think so many shy, introverted kids end up being professional poker players? Uh, I think it's probably just the gaming, uh, the gaming aspect, and the fact that it's something that's like entirely in your control. If you, you know, a lot of the guys that came from, uh, you know, video games, that's probably what you know. That's what they did was just sit and optimize whatever game they were sort of working on. And uh, yeah, for those of us that come through. Sp- come from like a sports background. I think it's just more like being a competitor and, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the same like type qualities, but in a different way. Kind of. there's, a, there's a moment in every, every movie called the inciting incident. And uh, it's, it's, it's a scene where the climax is always embedded within it. You know, it's like that happens. You're like, Oh, we need, that's what the movie's about. Like, is Rocky going to beat Apollo Creed or or whatever? Um, what was your inciting incident? What was the moment where, you know, you you grabbed poker and ran with it, or you, you could have left it? Like, what was the defining moment in your life for you when it comes to poker? So when I was a I was an engineering student when I first started in college, and I <clears throat> had a co-op job uh, where you like work you work one semester and you go to school one semester. <clears throat> and I remember I was just like, I just never, for whatever reason, never really envisioned myself like going down a like conventional road. Kind of, it was just like I always like need <laughs> needed like this. <laughs> I needed a rush out of my life, kind of. So I was working in this engineering job and uh, I just didn't envision myself like uh, I just couldn't take the job seriously. And I would often like, luckily the guy who uh, ran the uh, ran the construction company that worked on, like really liked me. So I'd like, I would often, I was supposed to be there at like 6 30 AM or 6 AM or something each day. And I would often literally come in, play on party poker, sit and goes all night and then come in, you know, on time. Sometimes I would like totally oversleep and wake up at, 10 11 (laughs) a.m so uh i don't know i just like as i just knew that that was the path i knew that it was a path for me i just knew that i wasn't going to end up doing a uh i'd sort of run some calculations on numbers but it it, and to see like if i could like make a good living at it but i mean that was uh, i'm sure i was i was thinking about it with much bias and like uh sort of you know, recency bias and I was I wasn't thinking long term you know what I mean well, a, str- a strong desire as well I guess a bit you, you kind of like I really want this to work yeah. you know what what, yeah. what fun like playing games for a living forever you know mm-hmm. I've also noticed I have a very hard time dealing with uh, uh, dealing with a boss or, or having anyone tell me what to do for whatever <laughs> for whatever reason I, 
I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a good quality, but, uh, but that's a thing for me. I've always wanted to do exactly what I wanted. So you like, you like, you, you don't like it when someone takes control away from you. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I haven't quite dug into that. It hasn't like been too much of an issue. So, uh, but yeah, it's, that would be interesting to take a look at. <laughs> so, so you run the numbers in this engineering company and then, so you decided to become pro. I remember when I, I decided to be, to become a pro, I was meticulous. Like I had a, I had a plan, like, so this is how, this is how I'm going to play on my, my online poker and I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to do my live tournament and it's live how I'm going to do it. What, what was it like when you decided to give it a real good shot? Did you, did you have a plan? Did you just wing it? What was it like? Um, I was playing, uh, I think I was, I had that co-op job uh, going, but I was, as soon as I would get home, I would like rush home from work every day uh, and start playing maximum hours from like, you know, 4 p.m. to it would be 2 a.m. And I'd, <clears throat> it was just everything. I'd pour all my time into it. I'd, I was talking poker with a bunch of uh, a bunch of guys at that point, like John Little, Andrew Robel, David Benefield. We had like chat rooms talking uh, poker a lot, and I just I was like, hmm, if all these guys think they can do it, then I you know I can <laughs> I can do it too. So yeah, I just uh, back then there wasn't a whole lot of studying; it was mainly just playing. There weren't a whole lot of like study tools, I guess. So it was mainly just like try to make as much money as possible. Uh, at, at this time and like still i i'm not sure i definitely don't think that i necessarily made the right decision but like abandon like the conventional life because a lot of i was ran really good as it pertained to variance just uh you know running good right away in tournaments and having cash to fire fire at more tournaments you know for every like one success story of me there's thousands of guys who like probably had the same vision and you know it brought, they probably dropped out of school and it affected their lives negatively so yeah, there's that there's that incident in um in Star Wars where Luke finds o- uh, Obi Wan right, and Obi Wan sees the message from Princess Leia and is like, "Come on, we got to take off on the galaxy." And Luke's like, "Are you fucking kidding me? I'm a fa- I'm a farmer, right?" Um, so that's like the inciting incident for him. But then he goes back and his his family have been murdered. So then, you know, he refuses the call from Obi Wan, but then. You know he gets into it right so you're in you're in poker you're just starting to get into it was there a refusal of the call was there a moment right at the beginning where you nearly didn't take up the offer of being a pressure poker or really going for it right at the beginning or was it just full sailing all the way um thankfully i never really faced uh faced much resistance because I, I just was in the right place at the right time as far as like the games i was in the people i was talking to like i've fortunately never gone broke um so i was i've never faced any like or i've definitely faced struggle but i've never faced a situation where i like had to decide actually that's not true either because there's been definitely been times when i thought i was gonna ban you know just like was totally over it just because the emotionally it's super tough especially playing tournaments full-time because you just lose almost always so it's Mm. like a few times when you have big banks it's like is it really worth, you know, is it really worth having this extra money in your bank account for like dealing with the constant misery? <laughs> and it's hard to like wrap, it's hard to just rewire uh, your brain such that, okay, you know, I'm cool with losing 80% of the days or whatever. Um, but yeah, there was never, uh, I basically when I, ever since I've been, been playing, it's been like relatively smooth in the sense that I didn't, you know, I didn't have to have an, I didn't have to say, oh, I have to, go do this for a while you know i have to stop playing for a while so um we've 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 started talking a little robo and we're starting to take this professionally N- today looking back in hindsight on everything that you did is there anything that you would do differently maybe maybe nutshell it for the people listening in who still harbor um aspirations to be a live tournament professional what what would you tell them would be a, a great set of things to to get down and, and to get into? Definitely working super hard, especially nowadays playing poker. I mean, nowadays anybody who's trying to make it from the ground up is going to have a much tougher time than I did, just because of the timing of where where the industry is and was. Um, working super hard is definitely a huge part of it. Like I I never really like you know I played a lot of. 
I guess it depends what you mean by working. I, I was in contact with a lot of the guys talking poker. I was playing a lot of poker and, you know, trying my best at it. Um, but uh, I was also like partying, <laughs> partying on the side. Uh, so I think just like anything in life, if you want to get to the top, you better be prepared to like make a bunch of sacrifices and, and work really hard. So yeah, I, uh, I didn't do that. I'm not sure I necessarily even regret it though, because I think some of those like poker is one part of my life, but then all like all the other experiences are another. So I'm super happy that I like spent a bunch of time just like traveling and doing a bunch of dating and meeting, you know, figuring out exactly what I want in a partner. I've met, met the most amazing woman that I could yeah. ever dream. <clears throat> so like being out there out in the world, I never really like, there's so many guys who've worked so much harder than me in poker. So I feel a bit like a fraud a little bit because I definitely don't think I'm like one of the elite players. I've, I've kind of approached it like, somewhat casually and there's been periods of time where i've like you know a couple a few different years where i like work really hard uh but i've never it's never been like a constant uh grind in my life and i've been on the definitely been on the right side of variance <clears throat> in at some good times um yeah i lost my train of thought but yeah i think just working uh especially nowadays you need to need to be working really hard uh if you want to get to the top because it's super competitive and there's a lot of guys who are doing what about um the importance of uh networks because you talked there about meeting jonathan little and you talked about andrew robo david benefit and they're pretty sharp cookies to be talking poker with i mean uh or now obviously but back then they must have been pretty good as well how you mentioned jonathan first off how did you meet jonathan because you're a shy kid from alabama you know to me thinking back to when i was younger say 10 20 years ago talking to some stranger online seems a bit odd i mean like how how, how, how did that work out that relationship we were both playing the same games on party poker and back in the the party poker sit and goes and back in the day there used to be a uh we're sort of like a in the top left, there was like a welcome or it was kind of like a chat. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but within the party poker site, you could message other players that were currently online. And uh, one day I was just berating uh, <laughs> a player in the chat box and he messaged me and he was like, quit, uh, quit talking to this guy like that. He's just like, we're going to get him to stop playing. I was like, hmm, there's something to that. And he was like, message me on AOL Instant Messenger uh so i did and that just was the start of our uh our relationship we talked poker like because we were you know we were two of the bigger winners in the games and uh we messaged and we eventually we met probably five or six months later for the first time we took a trip to vienna austria for a for a poker tournament <laughs> and met uh met for the first time and then it's been a great relationship since not every hero you know, they, they don't make it to the end without mentors. You spoke about Jonathan Little there. Who else have you, um, who else would you say have been real key mentors for you in your life? And not just poker players, because obviously life is bigger than poker, but who are, the, who are some of the key mentors throughout your life that have been important to you? I would definitely say uh, my, both of my parents were huge. Uh, I'm sorry, let me get this <laughs> desk set up right. Um, yeah, both of my parents were uh, huge positive influences for me, just the way they, they went about their business, just they, how they dealt with, uh, you know, any struggle. I mean, it wasn't hard. It was, I'm sure it was really hard putting up with my sisters. <laughs> um, also, my high school baseball coach was an enormously uh, big mentor, Coach Dixie. He was, uh, he was a, like kind of a disciplinarian, uh, disciplinarian coach and like if we were late by one minute, we'd have to run infinite miles. <laughs> um, so yeah, he, he was huge. And then, uh, yeah, I'd say main, mainly those. And now my fiance has just made, made my life like so much exponentially better having a partner to, uh, you know, that on whom you can reflect and, you know, use, use as a mirror has just been everything for me in terms of, uh, optimizing myself kind of. What uh, expand apart upon that a little bit, if you mind? What what is it? Uh, what's your partner's name? Sorry, Joy. Joy. Oh, what a nice name. So what what is it? What is it that what is it that Joy is is brought into your life as a teacher? What is it that you're learning from her? 
Uh, she has she has a degree in uh, elementary education and is additionally a yoga certified teacher. She all she also grew up in a farm in uh, South New Jersey, which just like in a she's very much like me, just very into nature and uh, physical fitness. Uh, so she's like she's the probably the most present person I've ever met. Mm. <clears throat> And anybody who's come across her is just, you know, have raves about her. So I'm still shocked that uh, that she's with me. But main, yeah, mainly she's uh, poker, the poker lifestyle and traveling the way I spent my 20s. I met her, when, I think, when I was 28 or 29. But the way I spent my 20s all over the place was such a fucking fast paced, hectic, uh, insane lifestyle where I just never like, you know, I, I was into... Uh, meditation a little bit starting around my mid twenties, but it was more like, you know what I mean? I wasn't, my life was too fast for me. It was more like a checklist thing for me during, during meditation and fit. I've, I've been in fitness th- since my mid twenties, but th- they were more like checklist items and they didn't, it wasn't enough to like sway my life away from the fast paced, like party life that I was living. It was just something that I, you know, they were buzzwords and things that I was told you're supposed to do. So I just did it. Um, so yeah, she's got, she's made me like a much more, uh, mindful person and, uh, just, she like does all of our cooking. So, uh, I'm much healthier as a result and she's just slowed me down. <laughs> like, like I'm sure many women have done for many crazy men. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, it's like, ha. Ah. How does she make you more mindful? Does she does she fucking whip you when you when you when you're future traveling? Does she get is she introduce um, you know more mindful practices to you? Told you to read this, told you to do this coaching. What, what is it that practically she's done that people could maybe pick tips from? Um, she she's not she doesn't like uh, put me in in my place at all, which is great. She just like allows me to make my mistakes and uh, and sort of learn from them. She's, yeah, she's uh, put, she's yoga certified. So she's put together a bunch of uh, yoga classes for me. Uh, Let's see what else. She, uh, like workouts, she'll, she'll let us, let me know because I'm so busy with my poker stuff. She'll sort of like uh, know when the work, when the classes are going on that we need to go to. Uh, Just, she's allowed me to open up, you know what I mean? She's, the first couple of years of our relationship, it took me a while just to open up. And now I'm like able, she's helped me learn how to, I'm more mindful now because I know what is, I have a partner with whom to like tell what's going on in my head. You, you so, trust. Yeah. You feel right. like you feel, you feel secure and you, you trust her to be able to talk to her without judgment. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's so many people now, especially now in today's world that just don't have anybody uh, that they can, you know, be vulnerable with. So, so just having that has, like I said, exponentially increased my happiness. Did you ever have any friends like that, that you felt that you trusted enough that you could open up, talk to them about anything? Honestly, not really. I mean, some, some little stuff here and there, but I think just being a dude and, and like today, now it's getting a little bit better, but I think guys just like, we're taught not to talk about this stuff. I mean, I'm sure you can identify, identify with this. Uh, but yeah, in the U.S., it's just you know, rub some dirt on it and uh, get back to work. Kind of. It's funny because I've probably known you ten years on and off, and obviously we, you know, we just meet at poker tournaments and, and, and talk for maybe ten minutes, uh, you know, here and there, apart from the odd interview. But I've always, always considered you to be to have a wonderful energy about you, to be really open, really calm, and I would have said that you would have been like. If someone had said to me, who who is who do you think is going to sit down and just open up to you? I, I would have said, oh, Shannon. <laughs> and so I'm quite, I'm quite, it's quite interesting that you're saying that you you are different. Yeah, I guess I, I, I think I've probably always been a decent listener, sort of. So you know how, like, you'll hear sometimes that people will think somebody's like a great uh, conversationalist or is like very open when in reality they're just like listening and allowing that person that that person would be so so i think i was maybe more more that and trying to like learn in that way i was trying to get to a point where i was could sort of be vulnerable um so yeah maybe, maybe that's it but yeah i've never uh i don't know i've kind of just handled uh, kept all my stuff uh 
within, I guess. I want to take a short break to remind you that we wouldn't be here in Shannon Shaw's Heroes Journey if it not for our sponsors, Run It Once Poker. It's an online poker room for players, created by players. And if that appeals to you, then head to once.run forward slash hero play today and you can pick up a 100% welcome bonus up to a ceiling of 600 euros. Now, there are two elements to this deposit bonus that turn me on. First, it never expires as long as you play one hand every 30 days. And second, all of your deposits during your first 30 days count towards a bonus. So remember that URL, folks, once.run forward slash hero play. If you want to rack up 8 million in live tournament winnings like our guest Shannon Shaw, it's about time you got into the gym. And there's no better gym in poker than Run It Once. Run It Once online training room is the most talked about online training site in the whole of poker. And as a thank you for listening to me hurling my questions at Shannon Shaw, they're giving you the opportunity to learn from some of the best players in the world with two brand spanking new training videos added daily. Yes, daily. And all you have to do is sign up today through once.run forward slash hero learn. So sign up today and you'll also get access to three elite videos, including one from the Global Poker Awards Industry Person of the Year nominee, Mr. Phil Galfon. He was robbed. and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, he, he was robbed. Has, have, have there been times in your life where you've associated with toxic people and how did you deal with that? And toxic environments because poker is a wonderful thing, but it's not, it's not always the most wonderful places. So have you ever been touched by toxicity at all in, in that respect? Yeah, I think, I think uh, at times just like being in the, like as awesome as poker is and as many uh, great things as it brought to my life, it's, I think it's toxic in the way that it's just like you're sitting at a table all day and just banging heads with people like trying to take each other's money. So I think that definitely uh, affected negatively. And then when it's, when that's your whole livelihood, you know, when that's um, like, it's definitely made me like really like, there's been so many times where I've just like hated everyone at the table, basically, you know, and inside I'm like, man, fuck this guy. And I'm sure everybody can deal with this because it's just such a competitive, you know what I mean? You're just like battling humans all day long, trying to take each other's money. <clears throat> so there, it's like really hard not to be swayed when you lose. It's like, you know what I mean? It just really uh, can give you some negative thoughts. And I still don't have the answer for how to like totally deal with that. Although I do think I'm getting a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's toxic in a way. Also, I think uh, I haven't really talked about this publicly, but I like sex was a huge part of my life. So like, uh, just the pursuit of sex and porn and that whole culture, uh, I think is like definitely had like some negative effects <clears throat> for me. I think like porn is probably one of the worst things for like young guys uh, uh, to be involved in because it makes you like retreat, retreat to your itself. So that probably had something to do with uh, me being more like introverted as well, especially with the, uh, accessibility that there is now just like instantly at your fingertips uh so yeah i dealt with that that was uh that was definitely toxic and just the part you know what i mean the party world is uh, definitely uh definitely a bit toxic too so yeah i i help people quit alcohol and um one of one of the things that people who come to me relate with, with me about is i i had a pornography addiction and I, I didn't even realize it until I got divorced and got into my, and then met Liza. And now all of a sudden you've got to be naked in front of a woman that is different to the one you've had for the last 20 years. And uh, I, I suffered terrible sexual dysfunction and pornography was all of a sudden used to kind of like tr try to alleviate that, but it just made it worse. Um, um, and, and for me to get over that was really challenging. Um, can you remember when you realized you had an issue and how did you get out of it and put it behind you? Because people, it is something um, that people don't talk about a lot because it's a taboo subject, but there'll be a lot of people listening to this who'll be like, fuck, you know, thank God someone's talking about it uh, because I, I really need help in this, in this space. Yeah. I mean, I, I had so much shame about it uh, until I realized just how prevalent it is. And you do now in the mainstream I'm sure you're, you're starting to see it appear a little bit more, a few more articles mm. here and there about it. I feel like nowadays, cause it's like, 
the reality is we're the test generation for like, you know, online porn use, you know, mm-hmm. and it just, like, it fell into the laps of like so many men and women at like at a young age. <clears throat> and it just like, it makes us uh, retreat into ourselves. It pulls us inherently. It pulls us away from, you know, friendships because it's like a, you know, a thing you, you have shame about. Nobody, nobody talks about it. It seems, mm. um, I'd say only uh, in the last few years did I really, uh, really realize how much of a problem it was. It caused the thing. What my relationship with porn was the fact that I would use it. It was. It wasn't necessarily the porn. It was the dopamine, right? Yeah. Like I think any, any addiction, like whatever it is you choose to use, it's because you're chasing dopamine. And uh, yeah, with so much struggle in poker and br- bricking so many tournaments, like that was my like go-to to make myself feel better. <clears throat> um, and then yeah, a couple years ago uh, or a few years ago, with my uh, fiance, you know, it causes it's hard to like both use porn and being be in a relationship kind of. So uh, there was like some problems in that regard, you know, just because it, you know, you're not very you're not very wanting not often wanting to like be with a partner, be with your partner, be like be a good partner when you use porn kind of. And I know so many people are, you know, I've talked to so many guys about this and that seem to be dealing with the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't say that I'm like, compl- I've still had, had a few relapses. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's definitely super toxic and something that if you're listening to this, uh, I would suggest uh, therapy and diving deep into the subject because it's, it's pretty intense. It rewires your brain. It's funny. I have a book up there called Wired for Intimacy. <laughs> it's it's literally about about that subject, you know. And I, I remember interviewing. It helped me a little bit. I went like cold turkey, and I just didn't want. I just didn't watch any of it, right? I, and there was that. There was that part of. Um, there was the part, obviously, around the relationship, because suddenly you're not focusing one hundred percent, and not you're not you talk about joy having that presence about her and being the most present person. Well, if you're like using porn and you're in a sexual relationship with someone like that intimacy and that presence and that connection is not there because you're somewhere else. Right. Um, so there's that, but it was also the, uh, the part was like, because porn is just not like a magazine anymore. Like it used to be with pros. It's just, it's everything. Then it was like, well, is this woman really want, is she really willingly here? So that, that was like uh, another big issue for my, but then I interviewed a sex therapist on my alcohol addiction podcast. And I mm-hmm. said to her, like, is there something wrong with me? You know, because like, I'm always thinking about it. I'm always want to look at it and stuff. And, and like masturbating started to become an issue as well, because you start to think, is that wrong? Is that right? And she helped me out. She was just like, dude, it just sounds like you're a horny dude who ain't getting it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, just cut yourself a little bit of slack. So my relationship is not like terminal. It's kind of like um, a lot more healthier. But I think how important is having somebody, that in your partner, that you can talk to about this? Because if you can't, it, it exacerbates the situation tenfold, right? Yeah, definitely. Hmm. Because it's such a shameful, uh, you know, there's just so much shame uh, associated with it that, you know, it just, uh, yeah, I realized I was just like, quite the uh was just going about my business like all on my own i wasn't i was never like um reaching out reaching out you know i'd see people when i was out but i wasn't making an effort really to like hang out with people i would just like hang out with people when i was out you know playing poker and then like and then before my relationship began it was like sort of my early early to mid 20s when I like didn't have any game and I couldn't meet girls or anything like that was a lot of porn use and then I once I like got a taste of like you know traveling through Europe and sort of like meeting uh, being able to like meet and actually like connect with women like that was like the ultimate like dopamine mm. bit for me so yeah I think uh, yes yeah, it's, it's very, very like complicated sex is like a super complicated subject obviously but yeah, that's that's my experience with it, basically. So pornography is a villain. Any every hero has to face a series of villains and then some master villain, right? But like, what are the other villains? Do you think that you've had in your life? And it doesn't have to be a person. It can be a concept. It could be 
um, a belief system. It can be an institution, a government. What What are the villains in, in your life that you've had to overcome or you're still dealing with? I would say just, uh, I think so many of us now, it's like, well, we're all products of like exactly what we, uh, what we consume. Right. So growing up, uh, like growing up in the South where there's like a decent amount of closed mindedness, um, and just like the, the news and the whole system, like the whole U S system, like everything, everything that we're taught, like so much of it is just like total bullshit. Kind of. So I think that it's been a big, just like, expanding my mind that's why the internet's so amazing now you can you, you can just use it to like completely educate yourself about all sorts of topics and but back then you know i mean you're just i think life is a lot more about undoing than it is actually doing you know undoing all the stuff that you've learned uh, in the whole the whole system and corporate america and all that i uh, i think that that has a lot of effect on people thankfully yeah, i like i got out of that uh somewhat early on i didn't always like buy into everything i never was good at like just being told okay do this you know follow this lifestyle but definitely it's been a bit of a just i, re I realized the what different things like the way that i sort of learned them weren't necessarily right i guess i mean on that like you're talking about societal conditioning and you know cultivation of city where people believe that tv is real i you know and I'm I'm half Chinese and I don't I don't think I I don't think I would ever go to Alabama because I'm half mm. Chinese and and that's and that's purely like if someone said to me Lee you got to go to Alabama for a particular reason then I would do the research and then I would be like oh yeah actually I can go to Alabama but right now this moment without doing any research you're the only person I've ever spoken to in Alabama and I love you to bits Yet from what I've seen on the TV and read in the news and stuff, I wouldn't go to Alabama because I'm not white, right? Like, what was it like growing up in Alabama in terms of, like, um, how people felt about race and how did that mark you and that kind of thing? Yeah, I should say that Alabama definitely gets, from what knowing what I know about it and knowing how I see it's portrayed in the mainstream, yeah. it definitely does get like a bad rap. Yeah. It's, like, a wonderful place to grow up. I had, like, an awesome experience. But, yeah, there's a... Uh, it's a lot of uh, just, you know, a lot of white people <laughs> kind of. Um, so it's, there's, I and mean, you see it, you see it in the U S too, just more like just in terms of like the uh, GOP party and those ideals, it's more like us versus them kind of. Um, so yeah, I definitely probably had some conditioning uh, in that way. And I mean, there, there were like, I've never considered myself a racist, but there was like plenty of like, you know, in college, like racist jokes being said all the time and shit. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's like, I'm sure I was conditioned on, on some level uh, just to think, think differently about people. Like, and that's something I've had to work through. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm definitely at a point now, like having, you know, traveled to 40 countries and, you know, live all over the place. Like I'm, I realized that like everyone winning is, that's what's going to make you know the world a better place. It's no like, it's and it's just fear, honestly. Uh, from what I've seen, just so many people live in fear that like others are going to take from them, uh, other races are going to take their jobs, and all the, all this crazy shit that's propagated in the media. Yeah, I, I grew up in Ogmore Valley, which is like a, a little Welsh valley of eight thousand people. I was the only. Chinese person there outside of a Chinese takeaway, but you never saw them roam in the streets or anything. And, um, and I get really annoyed when I go back and I, I talk to my parents and they, they, they're, they're all got this little closed mindset. You know, these foreigners are coming in to take our jobs and, you know, little, little stupid innuendo jokes, either, you know, sexist or, or racist. And, you know, even when my boy, when my boy was growing up, I would hear some sometimes and I'd be like, Oi, what the fuck was that type of thing, you know? So it's, um, yeah, poker will knock that out of you. But what, what do you like in, in, in poker? We, you know, we, we have this conditioning and, um, and then someone released a video recently with a guy going fucking batshit crazy in a casino, calling someone the N-word like repeatedly over and over and over again. Um, are you the type of person who's going to stand up uh, when you're at a poker table and that kind of shit goes on or, or are you just like, oh, fucking someone else deal with it? I mean, how, how are you on that score? 
I uh, definitely would say now I'm much more so uh, willing to speak my mind. For for a long time, I just kind of wasn't. I was just very uh, stoic and just like let whatever happen happen, kind of. Um, but I honestly don't feel I don't feel like I see that much of that. Uh, I I see people at the poker table all the time saying like making dumb shit comments out of just like insecurity, just like making fun of the other guy or something. But mm-hmm. never any like I don't see much like uh, racism or sexism. Eh. I do see some sexism kind of some of the comments guys make to women are unbelievable. Um, but yeah, I, I would say now, you know, the older you are, the less shit you put up with kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not always direct. It's not always directed. Cause I see you at a poker table and you're always dapper. You're the smartest guy in the room, uh, more, you know, nine times out of 10 and you, you know, you're, you're a big lad, you know, I don't think many people are going to fuck around with you. It's, it's more about, the, the the smaller guys you know and and and, and uh, the women you know and, and when you see something going on you think ah, you know mm-hmm. yeah i think just just recognize if if everyone who uh considers the opinion like considers the opinions of everyone else would just realize that like when they say stuff to you like that that it's purely coming from a place of insecurity and that other the person who said it then i think it would uh it's a great way for us to all just improve our, uh, our resilience and our, you know, toughness. Uh, cause you know, I've dealt, I dealt with it too. Like people used to make fun of me for my ears or being overweight or having a girl's name, like I said. Mm. And yeah, I wish I had that tool set at the time. I wish I knew how to, now I know that, you know, if anybody ever says something to me now, I just recognize it as insecurity on their part. What, what, how have you built this tool set for life? So, you know, we, we talked, we've talked a little bit about all these things, mentors. We, you know, we, we've talked about joy a lot, but what is in your tool? Can you remember certain moments where you read a book maybe, and all of a sudden your, your, your view on life changes so exponentially that you felt like a different person or you took a training course or you watched a speaker or you watched a movie. Can you remember any of those moments in your life? There's, there's been so many, honestly, I've, I spent so much time reading about, uh, like personal, my mid to late twenties, I was huge on the personal development, uh, train. So I spent so much time watching Ted talks, reading, uh, personal development stuff. Uh, let's see who I, I really like Mark Manson. He's, he's a great, great author. Um, let's see who else. The power of now was a great book. Uh, yeah, just, I think just just being and the more even now, like the more time I can spend, I've been slacking a little bit, but the more time I'm just able to sit back and be relaxed and reading and growing my mind as opposed to being in like a fast paced lifestyle, the more epiphanies I seem to have and the more I can. uh, The more I can not worry so much about my happiness and but instead like be reaching out and uh, checking on people around me, you know. Or talking to family or talking to friends and hearing what's going on in their lives and seeing if there's any way I can help them. Like that's definitely when I'm my happiest. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's probably the biggest uh, lesson I've learned along this journey is that like, especially in this poker business, it's all about uh, how do I find, you know, there's so much like, it's such a self so sort of absorbed. I've been like, it's caused me to be self absorbed for a huge, like, a huge amount of my life, but I think, uh, like being able to, uh, I'm trying to balance, like not playing as much poker just cause inherently it puts me into that zone and instead just like try to be relaxed and be more sort of connected to the world and, uh, see what's trying to have community instead of being so, so isolated, uh, in an isolated experience where it's all about trying to drive my own pleasure. It's, it's a dangerous, uh, road to walk kind of. It's uh, it, it is. It's almost like poker as a game is like just full of minefields, and you've just got to find the right people who've got the maps. You don't step on them because talking to you for like seventy minutes and listening about you growing up and you know developing <clears throat> that kind of per- perfectionism kind of uh, mentality which protects you against vulnerability. Poker poker seems like that could be a good antidote for that because now, although you smash it when you first start, you've got to you're going to lose more than. <laughs> Then you win, and for a perfectionist, that's that's quite dis- difficult to deal with. You, you you've got to hit a bit of humble pie, right? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. It's been a huge, uh, like I noticed there's a lot, like the majority of poker players are decidedly more chill about, you know, the, the swings of it than I am. I'm, I was hearing uh, Olivia Bousquet talk about someone about the same subject recently. And it's, uh, yes, yeah, I think he and I are a lot alike in that, like when you take it so seriously, uh, it's just like, you know what I mean? You're just going to lose so often. And just like, it's put me through a lot. Mm, <laughs> I wouldn't mm. necessarily recommend uh, playing poker professionally for anybody aspiring to do so. <laughs> every, every movie has a, a moment the the all is lost moment, you know, where we think they're down, they're beat, they're never going to, they're never going to make it. And then they, they, there they are. They, they, they get through it somehow and they end up beating the villain. Can you give me two all is lost moments? One in poker where you're really beat down and you, you got back and then one in life where you, you were really, the, the villain was really battering you and you managed to overcome it. That would be great. Um, I would say in poker, there was, what was it probably, so probably like 2015 through 17 was like, wasn't going too well in poker. Uh, I was mainly playing tournaments and I was just kind of, I wasn't working hard studying really. And I was, uh, you know, just, I was just sort of flying into these poker stops, showing up for the tournament and then busting. And it's hard, hard to get any sort in like, that's not, and these are high state, you know I mean? These are reasonably high stakes tournaments. Mm. So just showing up and not like, I wasn't really living the poker lifestyle, right? I was just flying and playing a tournament and getting eliminated. And that was like really, really tough on me. So there came a point where I decided like, I'm going to totally recommit myself to poker. And I just spent like, it was my, i just worked out and studied poker and was like, started playing online cash games and started doing well. Um, instead of just like tournaments, is just, the variance is just insane. So yeah, my like total recommitment to poker around like 2017 was, uh, was big for me. And especially in having the year that I had last year, I was just like, really in a flow state. <clears throat> uh, and in life, I would, uh, I would say getting past my, uh, my pursuit of sex and pornography was definitely like the most freeing, uh, <clears throat> like the, so I'll tell I went, I went 65 days totally, uh, without orgasm when I was, uh, at some, at one point, like early last year. And, uh, just like, the way the way that brought the f- clarity that that gave me and like the way it made me tunnel like i felt like i was fucking walking on clouds every interaction i had with people i was just so in the moment so i think uh sex is like sex and porn really steal your attention i think all things anything you're sort of addicted to i think steals your attention whether it's drugs alcohol you know it prevents you from being in the now uh, so i'm trying to like knowing now like tapping into just how like flow state can I can be in. I'm trying to monitor all my consumption, whether it's sex, alcohol, um, you know, food. And I try to keep a close eye. It's hard, it's really hard to manage it all. I definitely like, like right now with all the shit going on, I've just been eating delivery Thai food. every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you're right. You're yeah. right. Because it's a, it's energy. So, you know, every, every time you orgasm, you release an energy. Every time you, you know, you, yeah, you, you get those dopamine hits. But if you can keep that energy and then it's like a super weapon, right? And you're like, right, I'm going to fucking fire this at poker, um, which is that grit element that we talked about earlier on. Most people who develop grit, part of it is it laser-like focus on one particular thing that they're just going to keep doing and doing, get knocked down, get back up, you know? So uh, really mm. important stuff. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the business side of things a little bit, if that's right, because poker is not just a game, obviously, if you if you take it professionally. Um, how have you been handling it from a business aspect? And, uh, you know, you don't have to go in any details. It's up to you. But um, where does backing come into, into your life and that kind of thing? And, you know, poker is a game where you have to trust people with large sums of money and so talk all about the business side of it and how how you've operated as a, as a professional poker player from that angle i've uh, i've largely operated just on on my own for the most part for the majority of uh 
of my career. There's been times where I've uh, sold some action to bigger tournaments, or if I was like down swinging, I would just break some pieces off. I, I swap with people in poker tournaments occasionally. Uh, so that's how I handle, that's how I sort of reduce the variance. I'm trying now to, I definitely think to my detriment, I was very uh, closed off in the past. I wasn't, uh, I didn't do a whole lot. There's periods of time when I spent a lot of time talking to guys and periods of time when I would just like, there's a lot of ego I've, I've found that, that is in, involved in everyone's poker game. It finds like basically everybody thinks that everybody else sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, I think I, I fell into that and like just wanting to like figure it out my stubbornness. I wanted to figure it out on my own instead of, uh, you know, where if you're making the same mistakes over and over, it's costing you a lot of money. Um, so yeah, blow it, like to my detriment, I've been a little like too solo on this, on this road. So I'm trying to like, especially now, but now that online poker is a full-time thing, it's easy to be a computer and actually communicate with people about all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've never, uh, as far as like coaching or being coached, I've honestly never, uh, I kind of, I don't know. I, I spend so much time playing poker that that's honestly enough of a relationship that I want poker to be in my life. I've never really gotten too involved in other projects or, uh, I've never backed. I did do some percent buy a percent buying project that went horribly wrong. Um, yeah, basically for me, it's just playing poker and try to maximize. Uh, I've never like been, a po- I've never been signed by a poker site. <laughs> it's made me just playing poker, trying to, uh, trying to enjoy myself the best I can, figure out the game, get better and use it, use it as a sort of like, it's a great sort of thing to use for living your, for like giving you life lessons to like be your best person. Like I, I just have nothing but great things to say about poker and how it's helped my personal development i'm gonna ask you some questions random questions about money if that's right sure Mm. let me think of one that suits that's your particular one that's here somewhere what what salary level for another person starts to make you feel humiliated at your earnings? Do you have, do you ever have any kind of worries mm-hmm. around that angle? You mean seeing like seeing other people succeed, mm-hmm. kind? Of? Yeah, I mean I've definitely dealt <laughs> dealt with that. Just anti sweating uh, people at the top, particularly it happens when I'm down swinging, uh, like I've dealt with as I'm currently down swinging. Um, you know, you just like when, and I think it's the same thing in life when you're dealing with pain and whatever, uh, avenue or whatever aspect of your life it is, it's just like really hard to be happy for that other, other person kind of, um, so yeah, I've definitely dealt with that. That's a really interesting uh, phenomenon that I see, not just in myself, but in pretty much everybody. Schadenfreude. Is that the word? uh is that right well, well, yeah when well, we, we 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 get we get happiness out of other people's misfortune um yeah misery yeah. loves company <laughs> yeah 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 i would certainly get like that sometimes how much money would you need to feel totally safe um it's a good question i i have like a very humble lifestyle honestly i don't do a lot of uh a lot of spending I think if I could, uh, I've never reached it, but if I could reach a $2 million net worth, I think that would be, that would be a spot where I would like not have to think about money. 2 million net worth with a humble lifestyle. <laughs> uh, uh, what was your most foolish financial decision that still haunts you in the small hours of the night? <laughs> like I said, I've been pretty, pretty humble about it. I did spend $12,000 on a uh, Breitling watch which is, that's not even that crazy. I don't think I, I dealt it a couple of years ago for about 25% of the purchase price. <laughs> um, other than that, I would say just in, uh, in nightlife back in the day, definitely ran up some, uh, some party bills uh, <laughs> that I don't know. I don't even know that I regret them because I think it was like a huge part of my development socially. How does, how does uh, being a, a poker player, and the way that you 
you have to lose money to make money. How does that fit with joy? Because, you know, unless she's from the poke and she doesn't sound like she is, that can, that can, that can sometimes cause a little bit of friction. How, how has that gone for you these last six years? Um, it's, it's, uh, I always do this, but shout out to all wives and girlfriends of poker players because it's, especially if you're not in the industry, because it's insane to, uh, have to deal like to understand. I mean, I'm sure it's the same in a lot of, uh, a lot of different jobs where people are dealing with pain and they're capable of opening up. That was the, my problem for the first few years of our relationship is I just wasn't able to uh, open up about what I was going through. You know, when you, when you're on like a hundred K 200 K downswing and like all you can think about is like this hand where you're haunted, like whether you should have shoved, mm. <laughs> shoved the river or not. And these hand, and when like when one mistake or one hand with like such small edges, uh, that can literally just haunt you for days or nights. Uh, and every, every hand as you, when you're down swinging, like you just second guess everything. So yeah, it's really hard to, uh, I think for her, just like and it took a while uh, to just understand the business, you know, the longer we've been in the relationship, the more she just like understands the business. She's met like many more of my friends and sees what they're going through, talks to their girl, girlfriends and wives. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I would say, uh, anybody with a partner that's doing this, I would recommend, yeah, trying to have a community also where like your partner who isn't in the business can kind of try to un- get to know, get to know and understand the business as quickly as possible. I think as well, like for, there'll be people watching this that aren't poker players, but they, they love poker as a hobby or they aspire to be a professional poker player. Um, and I think this is really good advice to them now, especially now with the coronavirus. I mean, I don't know when this episode will be aired, but, you know, I I opened up to my wife yesterday. We had a fight yesterday, you know, and I opened up and said, look, I could lose everything right now. Like, live tournament poker it doesn't exist. Like, everybody could just drop me right now. i got nothing and no way of making any money because there's nobody's going to be taking anybody on right now, right? And that, as a man, <laughs> you know, in our patriarchal way of stereotype, I guess, and wanting to support your family, it's like massively difficult to deal with, especially if you haven't got somebody you could talk to. So if you are watching this, please, please, please open up to someone about those type of things, right, Sean? Yeah, definitely. I, I can identify with that. Yeah, we're just taught to like take care of, you know, our partner as, mm-hmm. as men, especially like as I'm down swinging now, I'm thinking, you know what I mean? Cause we're joy and I are thinking about parenthood mm. and uh, like, you know, that's in the back of my mind. Like if, every tournament that I break or every decision that I fuck up, like that's, you know, potentially that's a cut, away. that's a cut out the window. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, and that's led, that's led me to like put a lot of uh, pressure on myself at times too. Mm. And I, I try to bring mindfulness about not doing that, but I mean, it's, from what I've found, it's much easier said than done. <laughs> it's very it's difficult. Keep, yeah. hold, keep hold of that Breitling watch. You never know when you're going to have to pawn it off to buy uh, the next frozen dress. Um, uh, what is uh, So, like, coming towards the end of this, um, well, i got two, two, one more question to ask you before I get on to treasure, actually. I can see the trophies in the background. I see a little Poker Stars spade there. Oh. And uh, <laughs> last, last year, you came excruciatingly close on a couple of majors and looking back through your track record, you, you've been really, really unfortunate. You must've been like a fucking card away so many times from a good couple of extra hundred thousand, but more than that, you know, the, the trophy or the bracelet or whatever. Um, how does it feel like to have come so close so many times? Like, is it getting to you now? You're about to put your head through a fucking wall. Um, what, what is it? What does it feel like to you? Um, yeah, I'd say it was, it more bothered, like it bothered me more like in the past kind of, even since, since I've added like some second places and stuff in major tournaments, like it's, I'd say it bothers me less just because I'm much more like connected to the universe now. And I like, it doesn't really matter mu- at all, whether I came first and second in a poker tournament, you know what I mean? Like it only yeah. matters. To me, right. So like if I, as long as I don't let that bother me, it's like, it's not a thing so uh yeah i just try to uh i mean it sucks and it sucks to come close and not get there and obviously the 
when you're like heads up and there's a lot of money to be play, played for, or when you're you know three or four handed and you don't get there. Um, but yeah, it's basically it's not really going to change my life that much. Uh, whether it happens, it did bother me in the past just because I was like much more concerned with self image and like my image in the industry. Mm. But now like, I simplify my life and I just show up and if I play, you know, if I don't play well and I like that's something for me to like go home and evaluate. But like the result, it's not something that I like, I, I should say I try not to particularly focus on the result. Okay. okay. So that's really interesting. So that leads to the, to the last question in every movie, the hero has, has a significant treasure that they're after and they always get, otherwise the script doesn't work. So as mm. you stand right now, what, what does that treasure look like? Man, I'm honestly feeling like I'm living it. <laughs> um, I uh, So I live in Vegas, um, and I, I live right on a park. So I spend a lot of time out in the park and just like bike riding or running or uh, stretching, yoga, frisbee golf. I just love being outside and like taking it easy, reading. Like I, li- I enjoy playing poker. I get that opportunity. It's a delicate balance between like playing poker like my ideal situation, I love playing poker. The problem is you can't really like halfway play poker and like, and crush these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm trying to find that delicate balance between like doing the things I love learning. So I love like listening to podcasts and reading. So if, if a typical day for me is like wake up, meditate, stretch, go outside, hang in the park, spend time, like being around people that I like being connected to my friends and family. Like that is paradise for me. it's none of this like material stuff that uh, that we're taught to taught to care about that are all revolve around self-image for me it's just like living a simple life and you know being around people that i enjoy and having novel experiences and growing my mind and keeping my body uh, trying to improve my physical fitness that, that's it for me and um now now that you've gone from your ordinary world and we'll we'll Sorry, Alabama, we're going to call you ordinary world at the moment to the special world of the of poker. And now you've kind of come back and you're in Vegas and you're a transformed person. How, how are people going to benefit from that? Do you have a, a, are people benefiting from it now and how? And do you have any plans to expand that in the future? I mean, honestly, at this time, they're not really other than some like financial donations and helping my family out financially where I can and, and stuff like that. That's that's the number one thing that my life has been lacking as a result of this career and something that I was kind of on my way to uh, being like getting more out there and helping right before all this Corona stuff mm. sort of happened. And so I was like... I'm, getting to that point because I know that like deriving my own self pleasure, like it hasn't, it hasn't like exactly, I know that, I know that there's something missing. Like it's more about like helping out for the greater good and poker, you know I mean? It's a very like sort of self uh, indulging uh, lifestyle. So yeah, I know that I'm going to, I need to get out and uh, you know, help people be more involved. I think particularly, particularly in this election year when so much is at stake, I'm going to try to, uh, do some things in the swing state that is Nevada to kind of help guard. And then, yeah, just generally uh, trying to bring uh, positive energy uh, whenever I can and try to help, help people where I can. That's, that's my plan going forward. It's, it's tough to balance with like also playing poker professionally and mm-hmm. online and, uh, you know, spend time with my partner. It's, it's tough to balance it all. And I'm, it's an ever, uh, ever evolving process. And, we, and, and finally, just going back to um, that teenager who, who would look in the mirror sometimes and have self-image issues and, and worry about how he's going to fit in the world. What, what would you think he would say? What would he say if he saw you right now? If I saw the old me? No, no, no. If the old you saw you now. I think, uh, I think I'd... The old me would be pretty proud of myself. I'm pretty, it took me a long time to get here, but I'm pretty happy with the human that I am now. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of work to get to where I am. I'm not anxious about who I am anymore. I'm uh, surrounded by great people. Uh, I'm happy. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of myself mentally and physically. I think, I think I'd be, uh, the old me would be happy to see me. Oh well, Shannon, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for uh, coming on the podcast and sharing your hero's journey. I really appreciate it.
Thank you, Lee. You're the man. Appreciate it.